So it's a great pleasure to be here and to see many people that I know well and I've worked with for many years. And um, that's what I like about uh, the Fragile X family of researchers and the wonderful families that we work with. Um, these are um, very, very um, uh, special people to be around. And I love coming to Australia. And um, uh, I came here for the SSBP meeting, the Society for the Study of Behavioral Phenotypes. Um, and um, and uh, I wanna thank Wendy for uh, inviting me to give these lectures in Melbourne and, and Sydney, and thank you so much. And also thanks to Zenerba for helping to fund this. Um, I also want to mention that I, I do consult with Zenerba and I will be participating in the controlled trial. Um, and so that is a conflict for me, but um, I actually like working with pharma companies because any company that has a medication that could help individuals with Fragile X syndrome or permutation carriers, I love to work with them because my goal in life is to find better treatments for Fragile X syndrome, FAXTAS, and other premutation uh, disorders. Um, so uh, for the next half hour, I'm going to be talking uh, more focused on Fragile X syndrome and new treatments. And then the next talk, I'll talk about FAXTAS and expand to uh, other premutation disorders. So um, uh, I'm just, uh, for those of you, let's see, let me make sure. So uh, for those of you who know about Fragile X, you know that there are three disorders that are talked about. Uh, Fragile X syndrome, which this talk will be focused on. The Fragile X-associated tremor ataxia syndrome, or FAXTAS, and Fragile X-associated primary ovarian insufficiency, or FAXPOI. Um, but I want to point out, and in my next talk, I'll discuss this in more detail, that the neuropsychiatric problems associated with the premutation um, are very important problems and uh, they deserve a name because there are many individuals that suffer from depression or anxiety or other neuropsychiatric problems that I'll talk about at the next talk. And it doesn't have an associated name because it's not FAXTAS. It's not FAXPOI, and it's not Fragile X syndrome, and yet it are the most common problems. Um, and I discussed this a little bit at the National Fragile X Foundation Conference in Cincinnati, and we all decided on a name there. So fax and or Fragile X associated neuropsychiatric uh, disorders, or fax and um, was what was decided on, but I'll discuss this at the, at the next talk. So I want to talk more about Fragile X syndrome uh, and some of the problems associated with Fragile X syndrome and focus on the targeted treatments. And one of the big problems is this uh, extra sensitivity to sensory stimuli. For those of you who have Fragile X children, you know that sometimes they can be tactilely defensive or don't want to be touched or loud noises really bother them so they cover their ears or they avoid sticky things or have sensory issues with what they eat. Uh, and, um, you know, these issues are very problematic. Um, I like this slide and I've showed it for many years. So this is an adult guy with Fragile X syndrome who looks like he's ready to have an outburst and it's because he's overwhelmed by the sensory stimuli in that photography studio. So I want to focus a little bit on the psychophysiological underpinnings of this because it relates to the fact that the GABA system, which is the inhibitory system in the brain, is really underactive. Uh, and there can be an imbalance between inhibitory systems like the GABA system and stimulatory systems like glutamate system that's overactive. 
Um, but this inhibitory system um, is really important for the sympathetic sweat response to repetitive stimuli. So these lines here represent sensory stimuli, and this little graph here shows in normal individuals after a stimulus, and it could be visual, auditory, tactile, it doesn't make any difference what the sensory stimulus is, but there's a little bit of a sweat response, and then you learn to habituate over time with repetitive stimuli. But that doesn't happen in individuals with Fragile X syndrome. Um, and what you see is an enhanced sweat response to repetitive stimuli. So there's a lack of habituation to sensory stimuli because habituation requires the GABA system or the inhibitory system to be working well. And um, this is a big problem in individuals with Fragile X because when you sweat a lot, that has to do with a sympathetic response. And when you get a sympathetic response that is enhanced, uh, that can lead to anxiety. And anxiety is one of the major behavioral problems that we see, particularly in Fragile X males, but also in girls with Fragile X syndrome, anxiety, even when they don't have uh, significant intellectual deficits, anxiety can still be an ongoing problem. And individuals with the pre-mutation can also experience anxiety that actually can get worse over the lifespan. So as you get older, anxiety can sometimes get worse. So this GABA deficit problem um, has also been detected to a mild degree in pre-mutation carriers too. So it's not just related to full mutation, but it can be a problem in pre-mutation. And it has been studied also in animal models of uh, Fragile X syndrome. And it's not only related to the fact that the GABA uh, receptors uh, can be downregulated, but also there's a variety of um, channels like the BK channel, potassium channel, calcium channels that can be underactive too, uh, in addition to the GABA receptors and some enzymes that metabolize um, uh, GABA pathways um, that can lead to this enhanced uh, problem or GABA deficit um, or deficit in inhibitory pathways. And so this leads to the imbalance in inhibition and excitation. Uh, the metabotropic glutamate pathways are overreactive, and we'll talk about some medications that help to calm down that uh, glutamate pathway, um, but also some medications that help to stimulate the GABA system to work better. Um, but um, this is an area that um, has led to um, interesting uh, neurophysiological outcome measures. Now, I want to also say that in the world, uh, we are very interested in the prevalence of Fragile X syndrome and also pre-mutation carriers. And at least in California, about one in 200 individuals uh, is a pre-mutation carrier, one in 200 females, about one in 400 males, and about one in 4,000 to one in 5,000 individuals has the full mutation of Fragile X leading to Fragile X syndrome. But in some parts of the world, particularly in this village in Colombia, it's near Cali, uh, Colombia, South America, this village, Ricarte, we've done a screening, and we found that about one in 40 individuals is a premutation carrier, and um, um, more than one in 100 uh, has Fragile X syndrome in this village. So it's many-fold higher than what we see in the general population. Now, about one in 100 individuals is a premutation carrier in Israel, and about one in a hundred in um, 
in an island off of Barcelona, uh, Mallorca, which is a lovely island. Um, so there are certain parts of the world where Fragile X syndrome and carrier frequency is much, much higher. And in fact, when I visited this village, I walked into the village and all of a sudden I was surrounded by uh, many adult guys with Fragile X syndrome and I thought, oh my gosh, I've never been to a place where I walk in and, and see maybe 20 individuals with Fragile X. Um, I thought, whoa, this is ground zero for Fragile X. And in fact, um, we've done um, the prevalence studies there and looked at the founder families. And this seems to be a founder effect from the families that created this village. And there's some evidence that um, individuals who were conquistadores from Spain, uh, a couple of conquistadores founded this village. And I think that the carrier rate was much higher in conquistadores who came from Spain. And most of the conquistadores came from an area uh, called Extremadura, which is between Spain and Portugal. And it's an area that has a very high rate of individuals with intellectual disability. Uh, so I think there's parts of Spain and also parts of Portugal uh, that have a high prevalence of Fragile X syndrome and people are looking into it now. It's also interesting in some underdeveloped countries, um, and Colombia is a developing country, um, but there are many toxins there, particularly um, pesticides and insecticides used to um, um, uh, used in agriculture there and outside of the village. Uh, uh, many of these toxins are used regularly where they've been actually eliminated from other parts of the world. So it's an, an area that may have more of an epigenetic effect or a toxin effect in terms of uh, what the people experience. And um, we've studied uh, these three uh, women who we thought were gonna have the full mutation. This one's selectively mute since childhood. This one with a poorly controlled seizure disorder and some uh, intellectual problems. And this one with more difficulties with aging and she's in a wheelchair. We thought the mother was gonna be the carrier, but actually she was not the carrier, it was their father. And all three of these women have the pre-mutation, but far more severe problems associated with the pre-mutation. Um, so this is an area of more intensive research to really understand more about environmental toxicity and perhaps other uh, um, kind of uh, combinatorial genetic mutations that could be additive to either the pre-mutation or the full mutation. Um, so I'm going to talk about treatment, but it's important to recognize, I'll spend most of the time talking about newer targeted treatments, but it's important to recognize that when we talk about treatments in Fragile X Syndrome, it is really a multimodality and multiple professionals who are involved with treatment the occupational therapist, the speech and language pathologist, the physical therapist, um, and there are a variety of behavioral approaches. Uh, prompt therapy, where you use a lot of tactile stimulation to the mouth. Um, it's almost like a combination between OT and speech and language therapy, and can be helpful for the oral motor dyspraxia uh, or difficulty with motor movements around the mouth, um, particularly for those kids that are nonverbal um, for three or four or five years of life, they really need a lot more stimulation to get them talking. Um, and then of course there's behavioral interventions such as ABA therapy or ESDM, which stands for Early Start Denver Model uh, for children with autism, which is a naturalistic type of ABA-like intervention that can happen right at the home. Um, it was developed by Sally Rogers and Jerry Dawson in the autism field. 
But we've done research that show that is very effective for individuals with fragile X syndrome also in the home. Um, social stories, a lot of educational approaches, even um, educational apps uh, can be very helpful for learning. Um, you know, we usually recommend inclusion in the regular classroom whenever possible. Um, sometimes they need an aid to help keep them focused or to modify assignments. Um, but there's lots of academic in intervention ideas available on the National Fragile X Foundation website, which is at fragilex.org. I don't know if you can see it up there because uh, it is always written in um, uh dark blue here, which doesn't match too well with my background. Um, there's a lot of research, or more research should be put into the use of antioxidants because we know that there's a lot of oxidative stress in the neurons with the full mutation. There's also a lot of oxidative stress in the neurons with the pre-mutation. But some animal studies have looked at omega-3s and uh, uh, N-acetylcysteine and other sorts of uh, antioxidants, including um, uh, melatonin, which is actually an antioxidant too and helps with sleep disturbances. And there, there's a variety of medications that have been looked at in terms of stimulants, uh, guanfacine or 10X, Stratera, atypical antipsychotics, um, and SSRI use, um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to treat anxiety in fragile X syndrome. Um, and so I'm not gonna really go over some of those studies except I'll talk about an SSRI study, but I wanna talk um, more about some targeted treatments first, which can help to reverse the neurobiological abnormalities um, seen in the brains of individuals with Fragile X syndrome. So uh, this whole field of targeted treatments really started with the MGLUR5 theory about Fragile X syndrome, which Mark Baer came out with in 2004. That is, we know that this metabotropic glutamate 5 receptor pathway uh, is controlled by the Fragile X protein, or FMRP. And in Fragile X syndrome, when that protein is missing, uh, and this protein usually leads to inhibition of this pathway, but when that protein is missing, this MGLUR5 pathway is upregulated, and that creates more protein production, which is important for internalizing the AMPA receptor, and when these AMPA receptors are internalized, that leads to long, thin, and immature synaptic connections. So the idea was, is if you used an MGLUR5 antagonist and reversed this, uh, this pathway abnormality here, that it could cure the intellectual disability of Fragile X. And so that led to a whole group of MGLUR5 antagonists that targeted this MGLUR5 pathway. Um, and um, I'll show you the results of those studies, but there were big drug companies involved, including Novartis and Roche, that had created an MGLUR5 antagonists that were studied uh, typically in adolescent and adults with Fragile X syndrome. But I want to say that the Fragile X protein actually involves many different pathways besides the MGLUR5 pathway. And there's some pathways that lead to that um, the matrix metalloproteinase 9, which is a, a protein very important for facilitating synaptic connections early on in development, and also proteins involved with uh, GABA, or inhibitory pathways um, uh, and proteins involved with other pathways that we'll talk about in a moment um, that are influenced by the lack of the Fragile X protein. So it's not just this um, MGLUR5 pathway that's involved. And there's a lot of ways to attack it, not just the um, MGLUR5 antagonist, but lovastatin seems to downregulate this pathway. And I'll talk about metformin in, in just a moment here. Um, um, but let's talk about the MGLUR5 antagonist first. 
So there were famous ones, the AFQ 056, developed by Novartis, and there was an adult and adolescent study um, that was carried out in individuals with Fragile X syndrome, but it showed a lack of efficacy. And the same thing happened with the Roche drug, RO492723 uh, or um, uh, the Roche MGLUR5 antagonist that was also not efficacious. Now, part of the problem was when we did these studies, we didn't have the most, uh, the best outcome measures, and there are better ones now, quantitative outcome measures, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but also it was done mainly with adolescents and adults, and that may be um, a time when we don't see the best effects occurring over a, a, a three-month period. And so now, there has been funding obtained for the Fragile X Learn study. And these, uh, this study focuses on children with Fragile X syndrome between the ages of three and six years of age. Um, and um, uh, it's taking place at uh, f about 14 sites throughout the US. Um, it's funded by NIH, although Novartis who left the Fragile X field was willing to uh, donate the AFQ056 medication to carry out this trial. And it's a blinded trial. It's actually a fairly prolonged trial. Um, and these individuals uh, between the ages of three and six, for part of the time during this 20 month long trial, uh, they are on AFQ056, and for another time, they are on placebo, uh, but we're all blinded as to when that happens. But they also receive uh, uh, an intensive language intervention called PELI, which stands for Parent Implemented Language Intervention. Uh, and that is uh, an intervention where the speech and language pathologist Skypes in with the family right into their home. So it's done through the computer and the speech and language therapist, often combined with a behavior therapist, guide the parent as to how to stimulate language in the child with Fragile X at home. And this is very convenient for families. Uh, so part of the time they get the Peely intervention um, uh, with and without the AFQ 056. So we're very interested in this um, synergistic intervention where you use a, a behavioral or an educational or language intervention combined with a targeted treatment or combined with placebos. So we're very interested in that synergistic effect. Um, and uh, we've also demonstrated in, in previous studies that Peely intervention itself can actually dramatically improve uh, language in children with Fragile X. So it's really educating the families as to how to stimulate the best language at home. Um, so we think that these are two uh, interventions. The early AFQ056 we think can build a, a better uh, structure of the brain from early childhood and then combining it with this intensive language therapy can we be quite beneficial. So this is a long and expensive study and uh, we'll get the results. We will actually uh, complete recruitment next uh, late next spring and so we hope to um, uh, uh, 20 months or 21 months after that, uh, we will hope to get the results. Um, so stay tuned and we'll hope to tell you more. Um, now again, by blocking uh, the Fragile X protein, this upregulates several other proteins. Uh, this just shows a few of the proteins that are upregulated. Uh, for instance, this uh, GSK3 beta here uh, can be downregulated by lithium, and an open label study of lithium has been carried out in the past. Uh, I want to mention that minocycline is one medication that can lower MMP9, um, and we did do a controlled trial of minocycline in the past. Um, 
This has also been tried in autism. And again, minocycline is a medication that can have a lot of effects. Um, and it can have some side effects in that it can darken the nails or darken the teeth. Um, but in an open label study, it was helpful. Uh, it wasn't helpful in a trial of autism without Fragile X syndrome, uh, but we carried out a controlled trial. Minocycline, besides lowering MMP9 levels, uh, can actually lower um, inflammation. It's also an antioxidant and it's also anti-apoptotic. That means it can prevent cells from dying. And so it's used sometimes in aging studies. Um, so it has a lot of different effects, but we did carry out a controlled trial. It was a crossover double blind controlled trial. Um, and we published that back in 2013. As you can see here in the blue, minocycline had a better effect than placebo um, but and it was statistically significant, but there was also a, a pretty big placebo effect. But one of the things we learned was that the event-related potentials, which is an EEG measure, so we put an EEG cap over the head, and we can measure your habituation to an auditory stimulus, and remember how we talked about Fragile X patients don't habituate normally uh, to sensory stimuli. But we showed here with minocycline that habituation improved compared to placebo uh, when they're treated with minocycline. Um, so that was an electrophysiological outcome measure that showed benefit besides the behavioral measures. Um, and that is being used now in some of the newer treatments like the Fragile X Learn trial, where we look at event-related potentials, along with other psychophysiological measures such as eye tracking, uh, which sometimes can be abnormal in, in Fragile X patients. Like a lot of Fragile X patients have difficulty in looking at the eyes. So there's an eye tracker that can measure on a face that's presented on the screen where the eyes look, whether it looks directly at the eyes on the face or whether it looks at the nose or, or the mouth or somewhere different. And in fact, in the original AFQ056 patients uh, in the adults, we found that the eye tracker actually demonstrated an improvement in AFQ056, whereas the behavioral measures did not. Um, so now we're getting smarter about uh, looking at electrophysiological measures to help us uh, better look at the effect of medication. Now I wanna talk about low-dose sert uh, sertraline because we have done a study looking at low-dose sertraline in individuals with Fragile X syndrome between the ages of two and six. Um, and that was uh, really uh, thought about as a treatment for Fragile X because of the original studies in autism that show that the level of um, serotonin, which is a very important neurotransmitter uh, to help uh, synaptic connections early on in development, um, that that was deficient in children with autism compared to normal controls in some early on brain studies done by Diana Chigani. And also in uh, metabolic studies, looking at um, uh, serotonin as a neurotransmitter, uh, lymphoblastoid cell studies showed that many of the enzymes noted in blue here that led from tryptophan up to serotonin were all downregulated in children with autism and also that included some studies of children with Fragile X syndrome. Uh, and so using uh, sertraline as uh, an SSRI for treatment of Fragile X and autism seemed to be a good way to go. And in fact, Jonathan Cohen did some uh, sertraline studies in Fragile X and showed a really good effect. 
Um, it seems to stimulate uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a, a hormone in the brain that helps with connectivity in the brain. Um, it seems to calm down anxiety, which begins to show itself in individuals who, with Fragile X syndrome between two and three years of age. And it is uh, um, what we found subsequent to this is that it was helpful in stimulating both receptive and expressive language development or the trajectory of language development in individuals uh, with Fragile X syndrome compared to individuals that were not treated with sertraline. So we carried out a, a controlled trial of young children between the ages of two and six with Fragile X syndrome looking at um, low dose sertraline. So we're talking about very small doses between two and a half milligrams up to five milligrams for these young children. And we saw some good effects, particularly on the um, Mullen scales of early learning. And this shows several of the subtests and this just shows how many months better individuals were on sertraline compared to placebo. And many of these subtests, like the cognitive uh, T-score sum and the visual reception and fine motor, um, were significantly improved on sertraline compared to placebo. We expected that the receptive and expressive language would be better. And it was a little bit better, but only about a month or two better uh, compared to placebo. But when we looked at the 60% of the young kids with Fragile X syndrome who were treated with, um, well, actually the 60% of the Fragile X children who had autism together with Fragile X, those were the ones that showed a significant benefit when treated with sertraline. Um, so we think that that uh, has a good effect uh, and we continued to give it to young children uh, with Fragile X syndrome. Um, now I wanna talk about metformin, which is a medication that's a type two diabetes medication. And it's known to also help with uh, overeating and obesity, which can be a big problem in individuals with Fragile X syndrome. In fact, about Oh, about 7% of uh, boys with Fragile X syndrome can have this phenotype that we call the Prader-Willi phenotype of Fragile X, where they can have a lack of satiation after a meal. That is, they're not satisfied after a meal, and they can keep eating, um, and they suffer from significant obesity. Uh, and oftentimes it can be very severe obesity, similar to individuals who have the Prader-Willi syndrome, which is a different genetic disorder. It's a 15Q deletion syndrome, which can cause massive obesity uh, and many um, uh, other effects associated with obesity. Um, so, in 2017, um, uh, metformin was found to cure or rescue the Fragile X phenotype in the Fragile X mouse. And a year before that, it was shown to cure the phenotype in the fly model for Fragile X or the Drosophila model for Fragile X. And in fact, it was shown first in the Drosophila and then in the mouse that insulin signaling uh, is increased in Fragile X syndrome uh, and that metformin improved not only the insulin uh, activity, but also it improved the circadian rhythm problems. The flies don't tend to sleep very well at night, similar to young children with Fragile X that can have a lot of sleep disturbances. Uh, as many parents out there know, they can be very wakeful in the middle of the night. Um, and that's related to some of the circadian rhythm uh, difficulties uh, because some of the genes involved with the sleep cycle, including uh, the GABA levels, are disrupted with the lack of the Fragile X protein. So you need the GABA system to work well to sleep, and if it's underactive, uh, you won't sleep well. 
So um, the fact that obesity is a big problem in some individuals with Fragile X, and in fact, the Fragile X mouse can uh, overeat and be obese too, uh, and that metformin can help obesity besides type 2 diabetes, and that it cured these animal models of Fragile X, um, uh, we started treating individuals with Fragile X syndrome uh, with metformin. Now, it's also important for you to understand that metformin has many different effects. Um, it is actually uh, a medication that can lower blood pressure. Uh, it lowers the level of glucose in the blood. Um, it helps with um, uh, decreasing the effects of, of proteins that are involved with replication. And so it's protective against multiple types of cancer in patients. It's also a treatment for um, uh, uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia and high blood pressure during pregnancy. And in fact, uh, for type 2 diabetes in pregnancy, the mother and the fetus during pregnancy does a lot better when treated with metformin, even compared to insulin. So being protective against cancer, it's protective against breast cancer, cervical cancer, uterine cancer, and ovarian cancer, uh, and in many of the male cancers too, um, and decreasing the amount of glucose that comes out of the liver, uh, lowering blood pressure, uh, which is important for preeclampsia, and in fact, um, helping with uh, longevity. People on metformin live longer than people not treated with metformin. And if you have uh, cognitive problems related to type 2 diabetes, metformin helps with the cognitive problems. So there's a lot of reasons um, to take metformin. Helps you lose weight, protects against cancer, protects against type 2 diabetes. Um, uh, after studying metformin and using it as a targeted treatment in Fragile X, I decided myself to go on metformin. <laughs> And in fact, it works great. So um, one of the side effects of metformin is that sometimes it can cause looser stools, but that usually goes away after a day or two. Um, and the key to treating patients with metformin is to go up slowly on the dose. Um, so we did uh, uh, an open label clinical use of metformin. It actually wasn't a study, but um, we just, I, you know, didn't think about using metformin to treat individuals with obesity and fragile X syndrome until the animal studies came out. So I first tried it in those with obesity or the Prader Willi phenotype of fragile X. And I actually, because you have to check uh, fasting glucose and uh, what's called a hemoglobin A1C. When people develop uh, diabetes, the hemoglobin A1C uh, goes up. Uh, it tells you um, uh, how bad your sugar levels have been over time. For most of you who are aging in the audience, you probably have had a hemoglobin A1C done by your doctor. Um, and I found actually a rare patient with Fragile X syndrome who had type 2 diabetes and he did extremely well on metformin. So we published the first seven patients in last year in clinical genetics, and these patients range between ages four up to 60 years of age, and uh, all did better in their behavior ratings. Uh, all had improvements in weight gain and appetite control. Um, and we measured the behavior changes with the aberrant behavior checklist. Um, but the most salient thing that happened in this patient group is the families told me that they liked the effects on weight and on eating behavior, but the thing that they liked best is the patients were able to carry out a conversation and had improvements in their language abilities. Um, so that was a very surprising effect. 
And we decided, uh, we searched for funding, and now we are involved in a controlled trial of metformin in individuals with Fragile X syndrome. Uh, we're doing a study uh, between the ages of 6 to 25. Uh, we obtained private funding from the Israeli Foundation, and the FDA granted us an IND, that's a, a new drug indication for carrying out this research. And it's a randomized... Is about to close the night. Ooh. At we can stay a little bit longer, can't we? Okay. Uh, so this is a very simple study. We do studies at baseline, and then at two months, and then at four months, and at the end of four months, they're able to go on metformin for sure. So it's a controlled trial, so we don't know if they, whether they're on placebo or whether they're on metformin, and we'll see. It's also being carried out at two Canadian sites, uh, one with Dr. Francois Boldec, um, who is at, in Edmonton, Alberta, and another one with Dr. Sebastian Jacquemont, who's in Montreal at St. Justine Hospital. Um, and so this control trial is taking place at both of those sites. Um, in the meantime, I've probably treated about 40 patients um, with uh, Fragile X syndrome with metformin. Uh, last week, I um, looked at this um, adolescent boy who's been on metformin for two years, um, and he had fairly severe behavior problems, a bit of a prey to willy phenotype. Um, so he lost, over those two years, he lost about 40 pounds um, and now is in the normal range. And he went through puberty uh, during these previous two years. And uh, now he's 16 years of age, and I evaluated him and I measured his testicles, and he does not have macroorchidism. His testicular size is 25 ml. Um, and actually, metformin cures the macroorchidism in the mouse model. So I can say that I think I have cured him of macroorchidism or big testicles. It's not the major thing I wanted to cure in Fragile X Syndrome, but I'm very impressed that metformin is clearly down-regulating some of the enhanced protein production that occurs in, in Fragile X Syndrome. We've also done follow-up cognitive testing on two individuals in their 30s with uh, Fragile X Syndrome. One gained 10 points in IQ over two years. Uh, and the other gained eight points in IQ. So I think that even in adult patients, that you can have some cognitive gains, particularly in the language areas. In this controlled trial, we're using um, the expressive language sampling, which was developed by Len Abadudo. So it's a very good language measure to really look at uh, how much language an individual can gain compared to placebo. So I think in this control trial, we'll have some um, a good idea of how um, this drug uh, affects language, but also cognition. It's not easy to measure cognition over a short period of time, but NIH has developed a toolbox of cognitive tasks that are easy for individuals with uh, Fragile X syndrome um, uh, to utilize. And um, uh, David Hessel, who's uh, one of the psychologists on the grant, um, has shown that it can be very helpful in individuals with Fragile X syndrome to measure improvements in cognition. So we hope we get an idea, but I think it's gonna take uh, more studies and outcome in individuals. Now, there is um, uh, a group of young kids, after I presented this uh, last year at the National uh, Fragile X Foundation, uh, the mother of this boy here is a developmental and behavioral pediatrician at University of Utah. And so she came up to me after I did a talk and she said, listen, I want my son who's two with Fragile X syndrome to go on metformin. 
And I said, well, you know, the FDA hasn't okayed this for a study. And she said, no, I just want him treated clinically. Uh, so indeed, we did start him on a very low dose of just 50 milligrams once a day, and then it went to 50 milligrams twice a day. And he had a very good response. Um, and she put a video of him uh, showing improvement from being able to stack two blocks to stacking 10 blocks after a few weeks on metformin. So she put that video on Facebook. And I'm sure you guys can relate that uh, I don't do Facebook because it's too overwhelming. I don't even have time to get through my email. But uh, in the next day on email, I had a flood of patients between the ages of two and seven who wanted their child treated with metformin. So um, we have a cohort of individuals uh, who are young, uh, too young for our treatment study. Um, and these are individuals where we do an ABC pre and post, and we'll do follow-up um, uh, studies with the Mullen scales. Um, but we saw a significant improvement. The higher the score, the more severe uh, the behavior problems. But almost all of the individuals got better in behavior. Um, there's one exception here, and this was a boy whose mother said he did very well on metformin, but between the ages of two and three, he developed more hyperactivity over these eight months, which is the, the natural course of uh, ADHD symptoms in Fragile X. And even though he's a bit more hyperactive, um, she uh, really felt that his language improved. So um, metformin is something that uh, we're studying in a control trial, and I'll be able to tell you more in the future, but we're very excited. Uh, we do know that metformin can lower MMP9 levels, and it downregulates this mTOR pathway, which is part of the mGluR5 pathway, so it maybe has good effects that we see with uh, mineral cycling in terms of lowering MMP9 and some good effects on that mTOR uh, pathway also. So um, we have tried a few uh, GABA agents. Um, uh, Gaboxidol is a new one developed by a company uh, called Ovid. Um, and it's a GABA agonist that is carrying out a control trial now in multiple uh, sites um, in uh, the U.S. Um, so we will see, actually, they're comparing not a placebo-controlled trial, but comparing two different doses of gaboxidol, and if it shows some benefit, uh, and they find the optimal dose, then they'll carry out a controlled trial. So they're having um, good outcome measures, including this um, ERP or um, uh, the EEG event-related potentials that I showed you from the mineral cycling trial, uh, along with behavioral um, uh, and ADHD uh, measures, uh, so uh, and anxiety measures too. So you'll hear more about gaboxidol. I want to uh, let you all know that yoga and mindfulness meditation improves GABA inhibition also. Um, and I have a lot of patients uh, that are, uh, this is a high functioning guy with Fragile X syndrome. Uh, that uses yoga and mindfulness meditation on a regular basis, uh, as do many carriers to help with that GABA. Now, in California, uh, there's a lot of marijuana stores in California. Uh, the problem is, is what you can get in terms of um, uh, marijuana First of all, there's two main components. CBD is cannabidiol. Uh, it's not psychotropic, but THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, is, is the psychotropic part of marijuana. Now we know that THC is not good for the young brain because it can cause uh, atrophy, um, but CBD we think is quite helpful. 
Um, we have many patients that have been on a CBD tincture, um, but the tinctures sometimes do include some THC. It's oftentimes 20 to 1 CBD to THC. Um, but we know of many patients who have had very significant problems with anxiety that definitely gets better with CBD uh, and also aggression um, and um, sleep disturbances uh, can be helpful by CBD. Also pain symptoms can be improved. And in fact, I have some premutation carriers that have fibromyalgia or migraine headaches that can improve with CBD. CBD can also help with seizures, as many of you know, if you um, keep track of the news. Um, and it recently, um, uh, a CBD preparation uh, got approval in the U.S. for treating seizures, and I think also here in Australia. Um, so we like pure CBD, and Zenerba is one company that makes a, a CBD liquid that you rub on. Um, and in fact, they have carried out um, an open-label trial in Australia could be that many of you have participated or had your children participate in this open label trial of CBD uh, for Fragile X syndrome. Uh, but their main outcome measure uh, was an anxiety measure, the ADAMS, um, that has a general anxiety subscale, a social avoidance, a compulsive behavior subscale, even manic hyperactivity subscale and depressed mood. And these first four got significantly better on this open label trial, as did the aberrant behavior checklist, where there was also significant improvement. So now Zenerba is gearing up for the control trial of CBD in individuals with Fragile X syndrome, I think between the ages of 3 and 18. And so this will take place in... Uh, three or four places in Australia, along with four to six sites in the U.S. Uh, we'll be one site in the U.S. Um, Honey and Hustler in Brisbane will be another site. Jonathan, I think you're a site here. Um, and, um, and I think uh, in Sydney at Westmead with Natalie Silov. Um, so um, we thank Zenerba for moving forward with their controlled trial, and you'll hear more about it. If you haven't already, you can contact one of those sites to participate uh, in this CBD trial. I have talked to Zenerba many times about uh, a trial in premutation carriers who have sleep disturbances, significant anxiety, and or pain symptoms, because I think uh, that this Zenerba uh, CBD preparation could be helpful for carriers too, just because we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that it can be helpful for carriers. So I urge you uh, to participate in uh, some of these uh, trials, um, and hopefully they'll move forward with a premutation carrier trial. So I'm, uh, I want to thank um, uh, different people that we collaborate. I've had a long-term collaboration uh, with Danuta Loesch in, in FaxTAS. Um, I'll talk about FaxTAS at the next talk. Uh, and Danuta um, has worked with uh, Dr. Elson Story uh, and uh, Dr. David Smallwitz to start a FaxTAS clinic. Uh, here in Melbourne.